So, ladies and gentlemen, with that short introduction on Veltug and our ready to roll out action plan, we are now ready for the first of our panelists. I give you Jan Eekhout. Jan is a sailor, a tennis player, a football player. He's a very sporty guy, I think. And he's also a professor of economics at the Universitat Pompeu Fabra in Barcelona and the author of a book, The Profits Paradox. You might have heard of it. In this book, Jan describes how over the past 40 years, a handful of companies have reaped most of the rewards of technological advancements, acquiring rivals, securing huge profits and creating brutally unequal outcomes for workers. Jan, can I invite you to set the scene and give us some food for thought for our panel discussion? Thank you, Anne, for the very kind introduction. Thank you also for uh, uh, coming today. I'm very excited to be here, particularly excited because part of you know, what I talk about in the book is very much related to technological progress, to digitization, and it's uh, quite sure that I'm gonna learn more today from the discussion that you're probably gonna learn from me, so uh, I'm very excited to, uh, to, to interact with you here. So what is the profit paradox? As, as Anne already mentioned, the, the profit paradox is, is basically trying to get at the idea that, for example, you see a Dow Jones of 34,000, we're nearly getting to 35,000. We would think this is good news. This is something that you know, is saying something about a thriving, positive uh, uh, tendency in the economy. And in general, that's true because you know, profits are there for um, rewarding innovation. And what profits do is, in a kind of market economy, is, is, is providing the right incentives to do the right thing to make progress. The only thing is that once you have a number of firms that get high profits because there's actually too little competition, okay, because they manage to keep out competitors, then there's going to be a number of effects of macroeconomic effects that are going to be quite negative. And this is what I document in the book. I use data based on the research that we've done and we show that there's basically a direct relationship between that dominance of a few firms and it's actually a handful of firms. Just to give you an idea, it's probably globally around three or 400 firms. In the United States alone, there's six million firms. Worldwide, there's more than 100 million firms. So we're talking really about a few firms that dominate the scene. And by the way, it's not just the big tech companies. It's in all sectors. There's companies like Inditex in the textiles industry. There's companies like, well, AB InBev uh, around the corner here. There's Bertelsmann, uh, the kind of the conglomerate of publishing companies. And all these companies have something in common, that is that they dominate their market and they face very little competition. And what that allows them to do, it allows them to basically sell everything they have for sale at higher prices than what they would sell it in a competitive economy. And that has been changing for the last 40 years and it's been going on very steadily. It's kind of an, 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 a, a very steady change has been going on. But again, I want to stress it's a few firms. Okay? It's not the entire economy that's now, you know, all firms are having a wonderful life. In fact, most firms are having a hard time. And in particular, one of the things that we find in our research is that if you look at something like the startup rate. What is the startup rate? Well, the fraction of new firms okay, in, all, in the entire economy. In the 80s, it was around 14%. So 14% were firms that were new startups. Okay. You would think, well, we're living in a time of digitization. We're living in a time of new technologies. Now this must be higher. Go to Silicon Valley and it's full of startups. Well, the facts are that's not true. The facts are today there's about seven to eight percent of all the firms that are startups. And this is crazy if you think about it. You think about we living in this digitized world and we see much less innovation. And we can trace back that this has to do with the dominance of some of these firms. Okay. And so 
Now the question is, what is really going on? Where does this come from? And it's coming from technology, it's coming from digitization. And I think new technology is at the same time the hero of the story, but also the villain, okay? And what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, we have to embrace new technologies. It's what's causing technological growth, it's what's causing economic progress. You know, it's literally taking poverty uh, uh, away in, 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 in poor countries. That's what technology does. But it's also making our lives a lot easier. Who thought that we would walk around, you know, when I was a teenager, they tell you, you know, in 20 years you're going to walk around with something in your hand. It's going to not only give you a map that changes as you walk, it's going to tell you where you are. I couldn't think of that. Okay. So technology makes our lives so much more comfortable and, 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 and pleasant and it creates growth, and that's exactly you know, the role of new technology in the economy. But I said it was the hero, and I think the people from AWS and Google are probably kind of, and they should be relaxed now, it's, you know, there's nothing to worry about, but also a little bit the villain these two new technologies, because some of these technologies are being exploited to stifle competition, to avoid other firms to enter into the market, and let me give you an example where this is typically coming from, it's something that's inherently about how firms produce that favors scale and favors what we call network effects. And what are network effects? Well, the best example is to think about a 1990s, 2000 technology like what eBay does, a platform. Okay, and I'm sure many of you work on products like that. And what's the advantage of a platform? Well, it creates value, economic value, because it's large. Why? Because if I have something to sell, I want to go to a platform where there's a lot of buyers, and if I'm a buyer, I want to go to a platform where there's a lot of sellers. So I need scale. And what you see, you see an eBay in a world that in the mid-90s comes around and that, you know, it takes the entire market. Initially of online auctions, then just selling anything that you want, you know, just tr a trading site. Now you think, What's wrong with eBay? Nothing, because it, you know, it can do things that we couldn't do before it existed. But there's one thing that we have to worry about about an eBay, and it's the following, that you pay on eBay six, seven, eight, nine percent, depending on what kind of transaction you're in, as a commission. The cost to them is less than one percent. It's actually much less than one percent. So how come they can charge so high prices? Why doesn't someone else come into this market? Well, Yahoo Auctions has tried for a long time. Yahoo Auctions has tried very much in the United States first to enter into this market. They never got a toehold into this market, never got more than a few percent of the market share. Now, eBay says, you know why? Because we have a superior technology. Okay. But then you go and think, what happened in Japan, for example? What happened in Japan was that Yahoo Auctions was there first. And in fact, today, Yahoo Auctions has 90% of the Japanese online auction market. eBay cannot get into that market, so what's up with that argument of having the better technology? It's just that it's all about being in that market first, and once you're in that market, then you can exploit the scale which really this technology engenders. You want scale, because that's what makes your technology valuable. Okay? And these, this is an example of these network effects. Okay? And you, I'm sure that all of you uh, work with these or at least are users of those. And once we recognize that network effects are basically part of the solution and part of the problem, okay, then we can also better understand how we have to deal with it. So let me just give one example in the recent court case between Apple, the Apple Store, the App Store and, and uh, Epic Games. Apple defends itself by saying, you know, I set up my business, my shop, the way I want to do it. And I can charge whatever price I want. But that's treating the Apple store the same way that you treat the store of a butcher. Okay, that there's basically no network effect. But once you recognize that there is a network effect, that makes a huge difference. That makes a huge difference because it creates basically so much scale that you only want to have one large market, one dominant uh, player in the market, and there's only place, space for one, like there was, that's the case uh, uh, with the example of eBay. Now, 
who is affected by this? I think everyone's affected by it. I mean, you pay too much for quite a few things. Even the zero price that I pay for Google Maps, Maps is too high because, well, you know, they should be paying me. Why? Because they're using my data. So I'm basically selling my data. There's a bunch of things that I'm paying too much for, which is basically causing, you know, a negative effect on, on, on the consumer because we don't have enough uh, users using it. But you can also see that it's affecting a lot of businesses. A lot of businesses, you know, as I said, the 400 businesses around the globe that have the benefit of being these dominant firms are squeezing a lot of other firms. And I'm not talking about small firms of a few employees. It goes up to um, firms with 10,000, 40, 50,000 employees. They also get squeezed by these big players. And they don't get squeezed because, you know, these are competing them away. There's basically they get squeezed because they can exploit things like these network effects and the scale. Okay. Now, what is it that we can do about this? Is, is there something that we can do about it? And that's, I think, where you know, the, 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 the experience in digitization in the tech world is so important because, yes, the technological change is the cause of it. And by the way, this is not a new story. Fast technological change has, has, has happened in the past. There was, you know, now it's digitization, but around 120 years ago, around 1900, we had fast technological change too. What was the new technology then? Electricity, rail transport, oil production. What this caused at that time was also the consolidation of a handful of firms that dominated their markets. Standard Oil, for example, JP Morgan, a number of firms and individuals who became dominant in their markets. Why? Because it was the same fast technological change that gave them the opportunity to enter into a market first and explore scale economies. I mean, if you managed, as JP Morgan did, not only in the banking, but also consolidate the railway network of the United States, I mean, you dominate everything. And when we start to think about solutions, we have to think about what can we do to, at the same time, embrace the network effect, the scale effect, which is so positive in creating value, and at the same time, ensuring there's competition. There's competition on the network. And the answer to the solution must always be we want more competition. So I don't think the answer is going to be let's split up these firms. I don't think there's going to be an efficient solution to split up a, a, a firm that exploits the network. If you split up eBay, you're going to have two worse firms. I mean, that doesn't help. You want to exploit the network. But let me give you one example where nearly by historical accident, this has worked by separating the network from the competitors. And that's the mobile phone market in Europe. And let me compare it to the mobile phone market in the United States. In the European market, by historical accident, there's a regulation that says, well, we have to have interoperability coming from the tech world. What is interoperability? It says if you have a network of cell towers and you operate this in your country, so I have a phone plan with Movistar in Spain, they own the network, you are Vodafone and you say, I want to operate in Spain. The regulator allows you to go on the towers of Movistar. You pay a price and the regulator sets the price. But what happens is that you don't have to make an enormous upfront investment. It's as if you become a competitor of, a competitor of eBay on eBay's platform. And if you can do that, what happens is, well, you see that there's many more operators trying to compete. They're going to come to customers like me and they're going to offer me plans that are cheaper. I have a United States plan with AT&T. I pay about two and a half times what I pay in Spain. So try and get a mobile phone plan. It's going to cost you at least two times as much as it does here in Europe. We have people from Verizon I see here. Verizon loves this, right? Because, you know, if you look at the profits that Verizon makes, AT&T and T-Mobile, there's only three operators. But of course, in Europe, we have between 100 and 150 operators. True, they're trying to consolidate behind the scenes and there's common ownership and there's other things that these companies are trying to do, but we see much more competition going on in this European market. And it's because of a very simple idea that they have implemented a notion of interoperability that is separating the ownership of the network, 
from the competition on the network. So if you could have different people competing on eBay's network, you would have much lower commissions. People have done research trying to see what the effects are of having you know, Lyft and Uber using one platform. What they would do is they would keep compete on prices. You would see competition. They can't take such whole uh, large commissions as they do now. And the answer to creating more competition is, you know, using the technology, using the knowledge that we have known from the tech world in terms of interoperability to, you know, fight, if you want, the negative side effects that uh, uh, technology is creating, these, these large scale economies as we call them, or these network uh, effects. And I think, you know, this has been a tradition in the tech world. If you uh, look at what, you know, the, the, the pioneers of the internet, like Licklighter, so, you know, tech people who from the start said we need an internet that's accessible for everyone. Notice you don't pay to different owners of the internet. It's, there's strong regulation. Notice that you can send an email to any provider. There's agreements about the fact that it has to be interoperable. Also, even in the United States, you can change your phone number from one operator to another. That's also interoperability. And that ability to compete, to allow the customer to com compete, we have to actually regulate because, you know, if I allowed AT&T to even not switch your phone plan, they would even be able to create higher profits than they already made. So let me just conclude and say, I think that there is a, what we at least see in the data, a serious issue that's evolving and it continues to evolve, and people ask what has happened with COVID. Well, COVID is just even faster technological change. You know, you see that within a few weeks, companies had to react, and they did react, and the ones who won were the big ones. And some of the small ones had to step aside. And maybe new companies came up, Zoom came up, or maybe other companies came up, but in the end, it's consolidating the kind of already concentrated market situation even further. But I think there are solutions and I think there's optimism um, and I hope that in the coming debate or the panel discussion uh, we can get more of the type of insights that uh, uh, many of you have from uh, uh, your experience in, in, in digitizing in their companies. Thank you very much. Wow Jan, talking about food for thought, um, I gained a few things I've, I want to think further about. Can I invite you to take your seat? Many thanks for this introduction. And I'm sure our panel discussion will kickstart right away. Now, before I invite the other panelists, I want to make sure our audience that you know that you have your voice in this discussion. You see live stream audience, you see the Slido link on your screen. Use that, use the QR code to go to the Slido website and use the participants code that goes with it. And the people here in the room, you can have a look at the screens here on your right where the QR code pops up regularly along with the participants code. Make sure to post your questions, your comments, your own views, and uh, our moderator will pick up upon them later on. Now, digital is everywhere. It's a phrase we hear all the time these years, but it is true throughout every organization, in all corners of society, in each aspect of our lives. Digital is everywhere. And with our panelists today, let's have a look at the importance of this digitization and its impact on the economy. We have brilliant panelists for you. I already presented you Jan Eekhout. They all have a clear view in their field of expertise and they have vivid opinions. Let me call Daniel Jacobs, our own Beltig CEO. Daniel, can I invite you to take your seat? Sidi Jobe, Portfolio Manager, Exponential Technologies at Econopolis. Sidi, very welcome here on stage. You can take your seat. Patrick Putman, CIO at Manuchar. Patrick? Welcome 
to join us. And of course, Pieter Jan van Leemputten, you know him as a very assertive journalist at Data News with a very broad knowledge. I'm sure he will come with the right questions and give us an inspiring discussion. Everyone here behind me, enjoy the discussion. And audience, don't forget about the Slido link. See you later. Good evening, good afternoon. Uh, very happy to see you all. Uh, this is my first uh, physical event, I think, for most of us. Um, first of all, Jan, thank you very much for your very, very astonishing um, uh, speech. Um, maybe we'll pick into what uh, Jan said. Daniel, would you like to start? Yes, what I uh, recall from, uh, from the speech from Jan, there are two points. Uh, I was very surprised with the figures of the startups. Mm -hmm. As you see, there are so many incubators and, and, and a lot of uh, initiatives for startups. So I thought there are much more startups than there used to be which does not seem to be the case, which is, which is painful. Uh, and the other one is the, uh, the position to say it's not a good idea to split up uh, the, 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 the big tech, because uh, at Belt we, we, we have the same opinion. We think it needs to, be, need to go in another way, but that's for the okay. part of the discussion. <laughs> okay, Sidi? Uh, well, um, before answering your questions, perhaps um, noticing that the first rows of the, of the room are still empty, so some things have stayed the same, before and after COVID, <laughs> so uh, good to see. Um, answering, answering your question, um, I think um, um, actually the, the book that um, uh, was presented, um, I subscribed fully to the way that um, uh, we at Technopolis, I manage my tech fund as well, because we also um, have found out that there is indeed a core group of companies in different kind of sectors, whether it's medtech, whether it's gaming, whether it's semiconductor, uh, that really have that benefit, that skill, uh, and obviously as an investor, um, that is definitely something that, that we would like to see and that we like to see because it returns um, the profits, as Jan mentioned. Um, uh, we, we obviously also think about, um, okay, what can destroy their position? And uh, I have to say, um, for, for those um, category leaders, as we call them, um, well, it's very difficult on the short term to have their um, hegemony uh, being broken, I think. Um, and I think uh, regulators have been uh, trying, um, in particular in the Western world, okay, there have been a lot of initiative. I think perhaps in China, they're a bit more rigid in the way they um, uh, address these issues. What we now see, for instance, with uh, the, the BATs, the Baidu's, Alibaba's, and Tencent's, where the regulator clearly um, uh, shows um, yeah, their teeth, I would say. Yeah, once you fly too high in China, you get chopped off again. Uh, Patrick, would you like to uh, fill in? Well, I always like the historical comparison with what happened in the 1900s. And I also see the, the, the similarity of what is happening in the digital world with what, what is happening in the logistical world. And we see there the same thing, that, that actually big players are eating the market and, and um, competition is, is fierce. And at a certain moment, it stops. And then you have economies of scale that really make uh, big steps forward. And then you have the laggers who have to, to, to come on board again. And, and that's a, it's, it's a nice game to, to see and to observe. Mm -hmm. And I like really the, the, the comparison uh, in all that, especially the numbers on the startups was a surprise to me as well. Now, for the last one and a half years, we've been uh, mostly at home due to something that, that happened. I don't know what it was, but we had to clean our hands, wear masks. Um, one thing I've taken away from it, what I've heard a few times was the rich have gotten richer. And I think uh, AWS or Amazon in general has been a, a very good example of that. Uh, Jan, how do you see the impact of, of COVID to digitization? How do, are they, how do they relate to each other? I mean, I, I already hinted at it, it just at the end of the, the, the presentation. But I think to me, what is, is, is key is this fast technological change. And again, COVID is the circumstances changes. It's like in biology, you know, the environment that ch changes and you have to adapt, you have to, to mutate. And as a company, that's what companies do. Now, what we see with these fast technological changes like a COVID is, or the responses to a COVID rather, is, is that, you know, it's been consolidated again by these large firms. We looked at the data and what happened after March uh, 2020 was that, you know, the profits and what we call the markups and the market valuations went up immediately. Of course, initially they fell, but if you look at the Dow Jones, it was backed by 
uh, beginning of June of 2020, and it's been growing since then, even at a faster pace than it was growing before. So I think of COVID as being a catalyzer of that process. Yes, yes. Uh, Sidi, what, what do you think about it? Yeah, I have the same kind of uh, Boutade who says that uh, COVID didn't change anything. Mm -hmm. It only accelerated the trends that were there. And um, obviously, we all have experienced ourselves. We've been um, all of a sudden using our mobile to pay. We've been using e-commerce. We've been doing homework. And so those are the initial direct effects of COVID. But I think there is a, a second layer coming in the sense that uh, in reaction to the crisis that came out of COVID, a lot of central banks, a lot of governments, um, well, they stepped up the plate mm -hmm. and they poured up money over the market to basically make sure that the economy uh, again got lifted up. And um, I think a lot of that money um, has been going to um, companies uh, in the technology sector, probably more than in the traditional sectors. Mm -hmm. And for me, that means that um, companies that previously uh, were struggling to find money to finance their um, research and development, to invest in new machines, well, all of a sudden, these companies are getting easy money, what they call. And that on itself, I, um, for me, creates an indirect second round effect, which we will probably only notice in the coming years. Um, think about um, the entire energy transition and the money that goes into, um, uh, for instance, uh, stuff like uh, hydrogen. I wouldn't think that would be possible without this cheap money, because those companies probably wouldn't be able to have this rich amount of financing means. So it's not just the, the 400 biggest players on the market that have benefited from the crisis? Well, yeah, I think um, technology in general mm -hmm. has benefited, I, not from uh, COVID, mm -hmm. but from the way uh, governments and central banks have reacted to that. Yeah. Okay. Well, still, we're talking about the big cloud players. We all know who they are, uh, the big tech players in general. Um, we are all pretty dependent on them. I think if we would name them, I think all hands would raise if you are your customer there. Um, Danielle, is that a problem? It is a problem. As you've seen from the priorities, we see that now, depending on the cloud providers, is three or four in, in, in the mm -hmm. top 10 of the priorities. And it is difficult because, uh, as you say, there's a, a concentration, but it's not only the, the major cloud providers, it's also some niche players. We mm -hmm. have, uh, as Anne told you, uh, the, the SOM task force, software asset management task force, uh, where we have discussions on these items uh, every, every time. And it's also about, about yeah, different players in, in different software markets um, where they have a kind of, they're not doing illegal things, but they make it very difficult for the business users. Mm -hmm. Getting your data back, switching. We, we had discussions for two years uh, together with the European Commission and about 100 providers mm -hmm. Uh, to, to get your data back and to be able to switch from one uh, software provider to another one. There was no solution at mm -hmm. the end, which was very, very painful. So now with the Data Act upcoming, uh, we propose together with our sister associations in the other European countries uh, to come to a kind of a fair practices. And we were fortunately to see that in the consultation, those principles were already there, so we said, okay, this is for five years that we're trying to, to work hard on, 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 on new principles, new way of thinking. And finally, there is maybe an opening. It's only yeah. an opening. Um, so that is something, um, as Jan said, competition is, is so important. Uh, we are here in, in, in a Baltic occasion. Baltic, for those of you who are quite new to, to Baltic, used to be Belgian Telecommunications User Group. Baltic was created to, to fight for the old people here around us uh, to the monopoly of the RTT. Mm. For the youngster, that was the predecessor of Proximus. Yes, so competition is is is, is our DNA, yeah. and so well, in the situation we are in here now is just not very fortunate for. Uh, uh, Patrick, how do you see the situation? Because you are uh, part of a multinational, a Belgian multinational, uh, very active worldwide. How do you see the the pressure or the influence or dealing with those big players? Uh, it is it is difficult because once. You have to, you step into a certain ecosystem and that has a cost in terms of resources and finances. But nowadays it also, you cannot go onto two cloud players because it's simply technologically, it's too complex. You need too much people, too much resources. So you can only play on one. Mm -hmm. And in the end, if you want to sw uh, swap from cloud player, you have the difficulty that you also have to pay to exit it. To get your data back is a, is a huge hassle. And then you have to repay to enter a new ecosystem, which makes it very tricky to play. 
And you have to make a choice because you simply cannot afford to, to, to do two or three cloud providers. It's, it's not doable. No, and you're, maybe you're not technically locked in, but eventually when the bill comes, you have to pay a price to, to exit jail. Yes. Uh, Can I take the opposite uh, side of, of this debate? Please do. Um, in the sense that, um, well, yeah, obviously unsportive behavior is not done in business. Um, now, um, I do think that um, they have their merits. Um, I, if you look at uh, the simple example of the iPhone or uh, the simple example of AWS, uh, if you see what kind of um, benefits that they have brought, um, not only for themselves, but mm -hmm. also for a lot of other companies, for a lot of users, mm -hmm. uh, I do think there is something to say that um, I, there is a good um, to the bad. Um, and um, I, that, is, that is visible in, in a lot of sectors. I look at um, the semiconductor sector where you have one guy that is running the entire show uh, on semiconductor. Is it good or is it bad? Well, at least this guy is able to in invest 20 billion uh, in um, miniaturizing chips even further. That creates on itself, again, uh, other um, sources of good. So, um, yeah, uh, I understand unsportive behavior is definitely not done, but um, the fact that they are big, that they have the networks, that they can invest um, in, in long-term projects is perhaps also not a bad thing. Yeah. Well, they do have a certain value. I, I remember, sorry, Daniel? Yeah, of course, I mean, yeah. you're not against IT no, no, providers, no. let that be. But I remember, sure. I talked to the, 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 the CTO of a big yeah. telecom company recently, and they, they're partnering with uh, one of the big cloud players. Like, is it necessary that if we have to build this capacity by ourselves, mm -hmm. we can't do it, or it will cost us much more than if we would just go to Google or AWS or Microsoft. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, yes, and, yes. And one thing, if, if you ask the, and I'm, I'm referring now to, to the chief economist of, of uh, Google, Halvarian or, or Pat Bajari of, of uh, Amazon, they say that this advantage and these profits that they make are temporary. Mm -hmm. And indeed, they are making enormous technological progress. I mean, I love AWS. I, I, I you know, I, I have to admit it because it's just so convenient. It's so powerful. I cannot, you know, run parallel computing on, on 96 cores and run it myself. It's so much more efficient to do it with them. They say this is just something that's going to be there for a while. It's like what they call Schumpeterian uh, innovation that you have an advantage for, for a while. The problem with that argument is that if you look at similar technologies like eBay, it's been going on for 25 years. And I don't think that AWS or uh, Azure or whichever one you, you use is going to face more competition in the, in, in the coming years. And this is going to be consolidated even more. And I think that the challenge is, you know, as, as Cito was saying, you know, embrace the huge technological advantage but at, while at the same time ensure that there is enough competition. Yes. Mm -hmm. no. yeah, I, I really would like to add something, something uh, maybe something new to, to the debate. So you, you have the, the, the large players. I think there's a very big difference for, for business users, whether it's about infrastructure as a service or software as a service, because mm -hmm. software is really so much intertwined with uh, the way you operate your, your business. Um, and now I forgot what I wanted to say. Oh, no, I know exactly. So one of the examples we had just uh, last week in our SUM task force was from somebody saying, okay, we have a software and we use in Belgium Isabel, Isabel software to, to pay with different banks. Mm -hmm. And so now they are asked by that software company to, to stop working with Isabel and use mm -hmm. the add-on that they have for interbanking at their platform. Yeah. And that is just an example which we hear quite a lot. So it's, it's not just the software itself, it goes Step by step, it, it goes further, and so what we really would like to have, and then I would like to come back to the interconnection um, uh, Jan was mentioning, it's, it's the, the APIs, the, 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 the way softwares or data can be combined from different sources uh, without uh, too heavy uh, license prices for, uh, uh, for, for, for the combination and so mm -hmm. on. So that's, I think, a very important way to go. Okay. I'm playing Candy Crush in the meantime. Uh, no, just saying, I want to remind you all that uh, you can ask questions. I see some interesting questions coming in, so but please do. Uh, we will handle them as much as possible after the panel discussion. Now, as for, besides for the big companies, you also have a very tense geopolitical field at the moment. Um, and one of the examples I like to use is, what if tomorrow Cisco or uh, Huawei would buy um, Ericsson or Nokia, for example? How, how do you see the geopolitical environment evolve uh, for now? Uh, the city, for example? 
Yeah, I think in the last uh, two years and a half, um, I, we've clearly seen that on the geopolitical side, and in particular, um, I, the two big um, uh, fronts, uh, uh, the US versus China, um, well, there have been a lot of uh, rumbles in the Bronx, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, I, there has been an intermediary agreement, but then very quickly after, I think um, I, the rumble started again. And so what we now see is that, um, well, yeah, um, what they call sovereignty of continents. Every continent wants to be able to have their own um, semiconductor um, chip baker to make sure that they can have the technology for their data centers in their own hands. Um, we have um, a, a, the same in the automotive sector. And I think um, the position of Europe is in, in this is, is, is to me not yet clear in the sense that Yes, we uh, want to protect our Western values, uh, but at the same time, um, we probably can't uh, take a, a firm position as, as the US, for instance, does, because China is a partner of Europe. Um, Europe is dependent on the automotive sector, and China is a big uh, market um, for, for, for automotive. So um, I think uh, probably also Europe is a bit more milder in, in this geopolitical uh, aspect. And um, yeah, I, I think we, we, we probably see it the best in, again, I, this semiconductor uh, area um, where um, Europe has not invested that much in, in those technologies. And I think Thierry, Bre Thierry Breton um, um, is, is now trying to catch up on that. Um, some say that it's um, um, uh, not uh, uh, possible anymore for Europe to do, but I think we should do it anyhow, perhaps not for the next coming three years, but I do think um, for the coming 10 years, um, we, we owe it to our children almost to invest in being able to foresee for our own technology going forward. It's interesting because on, on semiconductors, I think he said he wants Europe to be 30%, I think, uh, wants to be responsible for 30% of the semiconductors produced, I think, in 10 years or 15 years. Yeah. Uh, uh, Patrick, would you like to add something? We're easily talking about China versus US, mm. etc. But we also noticed, as we're a global player, that, for instance, countries like, like Brazil, etc., etc., also have their own their own position in the whole logistical chain. And these emerging markets also uh, put in their own position, which makes it for us as a global player sometimes very difficult to operate. I recently had a, a, a VPN box returned from Vietnam because they refused it. I had a VPN box, no. uh, a VPN connection that we shipped from Brussels to Vietnam. It had, it was returned because customs refused it. It was a device that was not authorized in their country, so they simply shipped it back. Oh, okay. That's so we're on that level. Eh? So it's it's not only the big ones that are geo playing geo mm -hmm. geopolitically, but it's also the small ones that, that try to put their foot in the door. Okay. Uh, Jan, would you like to add something? I mean, I, I, I think that, you know, Technology now is so far reaching that really the, the, the market is the global market. People talk a lot about, you know, many of these tech companies are in the United States, but ultimately it matters where the customer is. And, you know, I think most of us have devices from all around the world. We use apps from all around the world. And where the consumer is getting, you know, treated badly is wherever that consumer is. Now, from an economic point of view, borders mean nothing, right? I mean, if you go back to the 1900s, then maybe the national, national market was reasonable, you know, a railway company, and you could say this is for one particular comp uh, country. But if you go back for the, to the first industrial revolution, then it was competition between cities. I think we cannot go back. We have to just accept that, you know, it's a global world. Now, politics is still very local. And that's something that we have to deal with you know, through international collaboration. I mean, there's the, the agreement of the G7 in June or May when they agree that, okay, we're gonna have to do something about tax evasion. We're gonna have to do, and that was, you know, between basically the OECD countries. We have to do something about, you know, interoperability, competition between companies at a global level. We cannot just say, oh, let's Europe versus China. Uh, let's look at the United States, Brazil. I mean, it's a global issue, and, and because we are consumers who, who consume from, from everywhere. And notice that on the other side of the companies, something that, you know, secretly they would like, many of these large companies, is being treated like in the financial uh, uh, world, too big to fail. So people now say, you know, Facebook, I mean, what can we do if Facebook fails? 
We're so reliant on it. What, what happens if, if Google fails? You know, if we can, as a, one of these large companies, achieve that the government is going to be worried that we're going to fail, okay, then we have a serious problem. Okay, we see what the problems are in the financial sector because then, of course, you know, whenever there's any financial crisis, we have to pump them up. We cannot let them fail. And, and I, I, I think that once you realize that, one, this is a global problem, and two, we cannot let it happen, although it's probably likely to happen, that these companies are going to acquire a status of too big to fail. Okay. Daniel? nice international approach and the reality the company space is a very big difference if i just see uh, the the meetings we organized about how to deal with communications in different parts of the world whether it's china or or russia or mm -hmm. whatever and the difficulties companies face like, like uh, the example patrick gave where it even didn't <laughs> go that far uh, if i see with the gdpr where we have i think 66 percent of the baltic members works on an international scale and then you want to do something in different european countries but in every country, there's, although it is a European regulation, there are different flavors of GDPR, so you cannot have just one approach. If you look at Belgium and at the future, so AI is now the word. Mm -hmm. If you see what is happening in Belgium, there are uh, different centers for thinking about uh, AI at the Brussels level, Flemish level, uh, Walloon level. Mm -hmm. So borders do exist in technology. So. Well, maybe let's hop on to the next topic, uh, regulation on digitization. That's I think often on a European level, which level? Um, what do you think about it? it? It's happening in AI, it's happening in privacy, it's happening in security. Uh, it's also happening slowly. I don't think it's going fast enough, maybe. Um, Jan, would you like to comment? I, I think of, let me use the metaphor of, of uh, football. You know, I think of regulation as, as a set of rules, a level playing field, an impartial referee. But sometimes people think of regulation as you know the government has to pick the teams and the government has to you know kind of you know twist the 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 the, the way they play they have to influence the, the coach let you know firms compete but let's make sure that there's a level playing field now that's easier said than done because of the political restrictions that we have um, but I, I I think it's it's you know, a, a lot of the decision makers are not even recognizing that, for example, more competition is possible. There's huge interest. Many of the big players, whenever there's some intervention, you know, use their lobbying power to, to obviously, to, to influence the, 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 the regulation. But we need some way to separate mm -hmm. the regulation from the political process, and that's an important objective. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, uh, I get the cue that we only have five minutes left, so um, maybe we should go to, um, let's see. Um, a very interesting topic, uh, Danielle, was about uh, more innovation in public procurement. It's something entirely different, but it's something that has been very uh, old-fashioned, I may say. It's not old-fashioned. <laughs> no, no, but it's, it's been a bit it's, it's something within Baltic, so normally the, 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 public, the people we work for are the IT decision makers of companies mm -hmm. and public institutions, and we have quite a lot of uh, uh, IT decision makers of, of public institutions, and they came to us and said, okay, we are working in, in a kind of framework for public tendering, and we need to bring innovation in the digital world, and there are some difficulties between the two. Mm -hmm. And so we had two meetings now, and uh, we are coming up with some, uh, well, we will make a position, because we've seen, for example, in, in, in the Netherlands, there are more possibilities than, than in Belgium. So there needs to be something possible at a regulatory uh, f um, level. But it seems that they all uh, companies can also learn from each other because mm -hmm. they were interchanging different experience, like, oh, you can try this, how you can do this, and so on. Uh, and why is this so important? It's, it's important be be because of the, the people. It's not only public institutions. A lot of other uh, organizations are uh, will need to follow that framework too but it's important for every one of us every citizen every company um, is is uh, has, has an improved situation if the, if the digital government mm -hmm. uh, would, would be improved so it's it's something which benefits everybody and that's why we said okay we are going to embrace that topic even if it's only for part of our uh, of our members okay now we'll go to the final question here my favorite one 5g and its opportunities um we've been talking about it for years and um it's almost there um uh, patrick how do you see 5g for for your company for your environment what, what does it mean 
5G is for me it's, it's a new technology, but it's not only about speed. Huh? We've seen it often in the discussion as a as a next generation of 4G, but it brings many more benefits, and it mainly brings them to business to businesses, and it it completely changes the the, the traditional telecom business case of investment, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. and so as a business, I think it is very important to have high speed, but also reliability. And, and maybe we will be able to, to stop building our own wireless networks worldwide sometimes and, and replace it by public technology in 5G. Do you see, you have a more international view, of course. Um, the critique in Belgium has been that it's been a bit too slow. We could have had this two years ago, uh, for example, uh, you often hear. Do you agree on that or do you see like, well, the world is still like waiting until we get up to speed with 5G globally? How do you... I have a mixed opinion on that because, first of all, from a technology player of view, if you want to mean something in Belgium, and we need to, in, then then we need to have it fast, as we had uh, the GPS, uh, GSM rather fast. We had multiple networks in Belgium, multiple vendors in Belgium, so other equipment providers came to Belgium to test their equipment. So we were leading. In 5G, it's happening everywhere else, but not in Belgium. So from a Belgian point of view, I think we, the faster we have it, the better. Danielle, I'm sure you have an opinion on this. <laughs> it's a bit of my frustration, but we are doing our best to, uh, uh, to get some uh, things done uh, there. Uh, we hope in the next week something will happen, but we'll see. It's going to be a very interesting uh, second half of the year, I think. Now, let's go to the audience for some questions. Um, a very interesting one I saw is, um, can open source hardware and even hardware as a, uh, sorry, can open source software and even hardware as a solution? Um, sorry, the question was formal a bit weird. What about open source software? Can it be a solution in this entire paradox where some companies dominate if it's difficult to penetrate markets? Is open source a solution? And uh, one of the companies being named is uh, Odo, uh, um, a Wallonian company that has now, uh, is now a unicorn. Um, are those companies a solution to the problem? Um, maybe, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Eckhart. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm an economist, I'm not in, in, in the tech world, but let, let me you know, say that in general, open source is part of the solution, mm -hmm. but it's not the entire solution because what regulation really does and has to do also is provide the right incentives. And if you have a flat open source uh, environment, depending on what the demands are and, you know, uh, different, different uh, demands require different solutions, but, but regulation goes a little bit further. Uh, and open source is like the Wild West, uh, 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 kind of the other extreme. So, so what I would say is each case is very specific and we need solutions uh, that are case-based. And second, pure open source in general is going to have its shortcomings too. Now, the idea of you know, uh, uh, embodying or, or embracing open source in order to generate, say, an independent network effect uh, to, uh, to generate competition, of course, that, that's very positive. Yeah. Uh, Sidi, do you see open source in your portfolio as it has it risen? Is it playing a role or is it just something else? Yeah, I think um, I, we, we do have own a couple of companies that um, have used open uh, source, a company like Elastic. Um, they, uh, they build a community around their product. The community helps to build the product, but they are the product leader and they understand the source code uh, better than anybody. And that allows them to, to basically uh, provide services around that open source code. Um, and actually it works well for them. So uh, I'm not sure whether it's a, it's a way to, to increase competition, um, but um, I do think it's a way to, it's a business model for me. And um, for some companies it does work, yeah. Um, a very interesting question from uh, my former colleague, Hi Kindermans, hi he, wherever you are. Um, what about ethnics and culture as a factor in monopoly, for example, uh, in China, in India, even in Africa, he specifically asked uh, to you, ask it uh, for you, Jan. I mean, there's, we already had a little bit of that discussion about the, the countries and the restrictions with, with politics. Politics already, you know, is tends to be correlated with with uh, ethnicity and culture. So that's one thing. There are certain things that do 
make markets separate, which is one of the main ones is I think is language. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, you, you, you cannot just create apps in all languages, for example. You know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And that creates natural sources or natural uh, habitats for, for having different, different competing platforms. I think, you know, these are the type of restrictions that are, uh, n you know, markets naturally incorporate this. So, so I, I'm, I'm not concerned about those. Sometimes with regulation we can bring down barriers where those, you know, ethnical, cultural differences, language differences are actually artificially held up. Uh, and, and, and there's more opportunities or, or, or better outcomes that are possible. Um, very interesting take here. Uh, isn't GDPR a proof that regulation can tame big tech companies? Uh, I'm going to throw this one to Daniel. Not at all. Not at all, no, because we, we have discussions with, with, with Facebook and with, with Microsoft and with Google, uh, with them not being compliant even after three years, where companies, business users are struggling because we all use those, those kind of softwares. So I don't, I don't think it's, uh, it's, it's helping them because we, 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 we just have now some DPIAs from, uh, from, from different companies. And the discussion is, is going on, so you see it's not okay. And a very big trouble now with GDPR is, is uh, well, you all know Barty Schramm's two story, where, where people even know, so don't know what to do now anymore with their data because they are running on, on, on US-based software providers. Uh, we, we had in the discussion in our privacy council from, oh, we now need to do uh, for the other parts, not US, but, but China, Brazil, India, Morocco, Turkey, Malaysia. We need to make our own uh, assessments of those countries. How are we going to do that company by company? Why can't that not be done uh, at a European level? So there is still a lot of, uh, a lot of work to do at uh, the GDPR level, and it's difficult for all companies. Does anyone have a different opinion on that? Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just one run, ring, run, ring. <laughs> I'm always surprised when there's like, oh, there's a finally a GDPR fine. Uh, I filed my, my first GDPR complaint uh, two months ago. I'm not going to say to which company. Um, a, spe a question specifically for City. Um, if big profits of cloud players are just temporarily, what's the next big tech to invest in? I think we need to listen if you own stocks. <laughs> Please. Well, um, I, perhaps first of all, the way I, we, we think about uh, technology is indeed um, um, the, the, the observation that a lot of th people think about technology in a linear way. And what we think to look at technology is in a more exponential way. And when we previously had a discussion on 5G, where yeah, people think, okay, we had 3G, we had 4G, and now there is 5G. Um, and um, I don't think um, 5G is mature yet. Uh, I think 5G is um, a technology that takes time. Uh, businesses need to learn and to understand how they will be using it. Um, but I'm sure 5G will be a blast of a success. So I think we invest in companies that are already today uh, positioning into 5G. Uh, you have chip companies, um, probably in a second, it's, it's a bit like um, 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 uh, a car way or an auto way. Uh, initially you have to build the infrastructure and that's what um, operators are doing today. Then in a second phase, um, you are building um, uh, the, uh, the gas stations because autos can drive without gas. And then in the third phase, you also put um, these nice shops where you can sell stuff. And that's happening actually with 5G today. Today, the infrastructure is there, but the services that really leverage 5G are not yet there. So for me, 5G is definitely one. Uh, I think um, uh, a, lot of a lot of people here in the room, um, they also break their heads around cybersecurity. Again, uh, the idea of exponentiality, um, I, the, 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 the speed that we have taken with data creation thanks to COVID or due to COVID actually, um, is only the beginning of, of the layer. Uh, all of you have laid lines to your employees, to your customers, to your partners. Everybody is now interacting with your network and there is a huge amount of data that is coming up on you. Well, for me, that data will only go exponentially up and the complexity um, the surface of cybersecurity um, uh, assets that you will have to protect is huge. So cybersecurity is, for instance, another one um, in, uh, in our field of, uh, of investments. And probably I have, I have 10 more of them. But uh. <laughs> um, I think we almost need to close down. So I'm going to throw one more question at uh, Daniel. 
Um, why does Beltech think that splitting up big tech is a bad idea? And what's the alternative? Because of the same argument that Jan used, because uh, uh, we, we, they are good products. So if you, if you would split those companies, then you, leave, you, you lose your economies of scale. So that's, that's not the way to go. Uh, and and the, the alternative, I think, the interconnection part, the APIs, the, the being able to use to combine data from different sources. And of course, what we try to do now with, uh, with the fair practices uh, at, the, at the level of the European a commission to say, okay, if you want to have your data back, it should be at a reasonable cost and, and in, in a reasonable time. So and those kind of principles? Instead of splitting up. For us, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, well, I think uh, that this would uh, conclude the panel. Uh, Danielle, I think you have the final say here. I have a final say, which is a very short say, so I just want to thank everybody who is here, also the people uh, that are at home. For those people, we cannot offer a drink, but for all the other ones, the food and the drinks are waiting for you. So thank you very, very much for being here. This is really very nice.